Hello and welcome to the Worth the Hike podcast. I'm your host, B, and this is where I give you tips and tricks for exploring some of the country's most wild landscapes and scenic trails. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and have hiked my entire life. Since the summer of 2020, I've completed 386 trails, visited 33 national parks, and hiked over 1,400 miles. Some of the more notable being Half Dome in Yosemite National Park, Angel's Landing in Zion, and Bright Angel to South Kebab in the Grand Canyon. Today we are taking a look at arguably one of the most beautiful hikes in the national park system, the Mist Trail in Yosemite National Park. We will be taking a look at how to get there, what to expect, what gear you'll need, and my overall rating for the trail. Let's get into it. First and foremost, I'd highly recommend downloading this podcast now, as you will lose service about an hour outside the park. If you're watching this on YouTube, head on over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you're visiting for the day or planning an entire trip, this information could be the difference in maximizing your journey. Please also download the Google Maps for Yosemite National Park, the All Trails Map for the Mist Trail, and any other podcast or music that you will want to listen to on your driver hike. If you're not already, I would highly recommend becoming an All Trails Pro member so you can keep track of your hiking stats and all the trails you've completed. It costs about $36 a year. And wherever you may be watching or listening, feel free to rate, like, and subscribe. I only post this content in the hopes of being able to help people that love hiking as much as I do. Every little bit of support means the world. Also, feel free to follow and reach out on socials, Instagram, at WorthTheHikePod, TikTok, WorthTheHike, and you can reach me by email at WorthTheHikePod at gmail.com. All links, socials, trails, gear, etc. will be found in the description below. While I would recommend having all of your gear ready in advance, such as water, food, and hiking equipment, just to save yourself some time, if you happen to forget anything, one of the stores in Yosemite Valley should have a substitute for anything you might have forgotten at home. Personally, I'd recommend grabbing a sandwich at Degnan's Deli before or after your hike, a quiet and quality spot with reasonably priced food. There are gas stations in the park, most notably one at the Crane Flat, as well as supercharging stations for those of you driving electric. You'll be able to find pockets of cell service within the valley, but it can be a little unreliable for downloading, so I would still recommend downloading all Google Maps, all trails, music, podcasts, etc. in advance. You can find pockets of cell service at high elevations in the park as well, but again, this is not something that I would rely on. It's important to remember that while pets are allowed on paved areas of the park trails in Yosemite, pets are not allowed on most of the trails in the park. This includes the Mist Trail. So please leave the pooches at home if you're going to be hiking this trail. Service animals are exempt, this does not include emotional support animals. If you have the luxury to check the weather ahead of time, please make sure to do so. While you most likely find beautiful sunny days if you are visiting Yosemite in the summer months, the Sierra Nevadas can be unpredictable with thunderstorms arriving out of nowhere. You'll most likely be covered in water, a la the Mist Trail, so it's better to be safe than sorry. Plus, you want to make sure you catch those gorgeous waterfalls glimmering in all of their immense glory for your once-in-a-lifetime photos. Now it's time for the fun part. Let's dig into one of America's greatest treasures, the Mist Trail. If you were taking the shuttle to get here, this will be stop number 16. There's also a bathroom available here. You're going to want to start this trail in the morning. This will help you to avoid the crowds, but it will also help to avoid the afternoon heat that catches many hikers off guard. Make sure to stretch out before you get started. You want to be limber for the inevitable incline and any potential slips along the soaking wet path. In total, this trail is 6.4 miles round trip with 2,200 feet of elevation gain. Starting the trail, you will continue on a flat dirt path and run into park staff with maps and information on the trail, including hazards and closures. Currently, the John Muir Trail is closed from the end of the Panorama Trail to Clark Point due to trail instability from the heavy winter storms. The entire hillside could potentially give way at any moment, so please follow park rules and avoid risking your own life. Continuing on the path, you will run into a paved portion of the trail in your first incline, Views of the valley start to open as you gain elevation. Especially this year, waterfalls can be seen in almost any direction. You will continue on this trail about three quarters of a mile until you reach the Vernal Falls footbridge. This is a good rest area if needed. Restrooms and water are both available here. Make sure to fill up your water bottle if you haven't yet, as this will be the last area to get potable water. This is also where you're going to want to throw on whatever waterproof items you may have brought. Poncho, backpack cover, rain jacket, whatever it may be, because it's about to get really wet. Go about another quarter of a mile, and now you're officially in the mist. Water can be seen cascading from Vernal Falls, smashing against granite, causing water to fill the air. As you begin to climb the stairs, do not forget to look back, as you will see a full rainbow behind you on sunny days. Especially this year, you must be extra careful. The rocks are completely soaked with water, and the trail is extremely narrow. Easy to slip, and easy to get hurt. This will be one of the best shots of Vernal Falls that you can get, so make sure to get some photos in the chaos of it all. Truly a one-of-a-kind experience. You continue along the stairway, most likely behind a long line of people, until you reach a turn. The trail really tightens here and can get a bit daunting to those afraid of heights. As you complete the staircase, you are now arriving at the top of Vernal Falls in the Emerald Pool area. Many decide to rest here so that they can take in the views and dry off. This area is very flat, with many areas to kick back and relax. 
as well as a restroom located only a short walk away. But this is only one stop on this magnificent hike. Next on the list is Nevada Falls, located another 1.3 miles and 900 feet of elevation past the peak of Vernal Falls. As you continue, you will see Nevada Falls starting to peak through the ridgeline, making brief appearances, but do not stress, there will be ample opportunities to view the falls with much better photo opportunities. Another quarter of a mile past the Emerald Pool, you will run across a bridge on the north side of the water. As you continue, you will run into a curve in the trail, just over two miles in. In a normal year, this would be the first spot where you'd take in Nevada Falls, but due to the explosion of water at the base, a layer of spray blocks visibility. I would continue onward for another quarter of a mile to where you'll be treated to tremendous views in Nevada Falls. You'll be able to see the entire silhouette with areas for you to step off to the side and take photos. Again, this area is both slick and narrow, so be safe and courteous to those around you. You'll continue on the trail until you reach the peak of Nevada Falls, another wonderful spot to stop and have lunch. Much larger than the Vernal Falls resting point, with a much better view. The roar of the waterfall, Liberty Cap towering, and the valley floor opening up, truly hard to beat. This is my personal favorite shot of Nevada Falls. You will find a railing system off to the northern side of the falls, where the roar of the water vibrates the fencing. And you can get some of the most spectacular footage that you can possibly have of any waterfall. During normal years, I would recommend completing the Mist Trail Loop, continuing on the John Muir Trail. But due to abnormal amounts of snow and water damage, as previously stated, the John Muir Trail has been closed for the foreseeable future. Respect park rules and obey the signs. The ledge could give way at any moment. Be smart and don't risk it. And while you will have to retrace your steps for about a mile, once you cross the bridge again, you will want to keep a lookout for a sign that says Clark Point. This will allow you to skip the torrential downpour from Vernal Falls and give you the chance to witness arguably the best view in all of Yosemite National Park. You'll be walking the trail for about a quarter of a mile, most likely starting to see wildflowers blooming on either side. Don't forget to grab some awesome photos of Nevada Falls from here, but the real gem is when you turn the corner and instead of continuing on to Clark Point, you'll walk over to a small ledge looking down over Vernal Falls. And I have to be honest, this was the first time I had seen this point, and it took my breath away. Truly stunning. Such a blessing to witness something so beautiful with my own eyes. This is really what made the whole trip, and is arguably one of my favorite places in all of Yosemite. Once you have finished treating yourself, you can continue up to Clark Point, which gives you an awesome 180 degree view, with Nevada Falls, Liberty Cap, and even the back of Half Dome towering in the distance. The rest of the trail will be a little over two miles, but thankfully, you are now in the home stretch and it is all downhill from here. And that is it. The Mist Trail in Yosemite National Park. After all of that, I'd like to give an overall rating for the trail. I based it on four different categories. The highlights, the uniqueness, the accessibility, and the drawbacks. Each of which I will give a score out of 25. First, the highlights. You would experience two of the most gorgeous waterfalls you've ever seen in Nevada and Vernal Falls, both from a distance and up close and personal. Next, visually stunning rocks. Beautifully carved towers of granite, the Liberty Cap, Half Dome, and Glacier Point. Not to mention the wildlife, flowers, deer, and the occasional black bear roam in the hillside. And last, but certainly not least, the amazing vantage points found throughout the trail, where you can take in this special place and make a memory that'll last a lifetime. This hike truly has everything. Without hesitation, when it comes to the highlights, this hike is a 25 out of 25. Next, uniqueness. Continuing on from the highlights, I've hiked a lot in my life. And to have mountains, waterfalls, and wildlife combined in such a flawless manner is almost unheard of. There's a reason that those around the world seek Yosemite, because it is a treasure that cannot be found anywhere else. Again, a 25 out of 25. Next, accessibility. It's a relatively close drive from three international airports. You can easily walk to the trailhead from your sleeping accommodations within a valley. It's a partially paved trail for those with difficulty hiking. Potable water is available along the trail, which is extremely rare in most places. It's an extremely short hike for the payoff. Hard to find better value for your time. The only downside is the limitations of the winter months. 22 out of 25. Finally, the drawbacks. Crowds. It gets extremely packed. If Yosemite brings back the permit system like they had during COVID, the score could change. But for now, this one is hard to overlook and can take away from your overall trip. That's why you have to get there early or show up on a weekday. 17 out of 25. Overall, when you add all four scores together, I give this trail a 90 out of 100. For those that seek out the natural world, this trail needs to be something you experience at least once in your life. This is arguably the best day hike in the United States of America. Here are some alternative trails from within the valley. If you continue along the Mist Trail, you can make it up to Half Dome. Again, this is a difficult permitting process, and you're going to want to check Yosemite's website for the latest information. Round trip is about 15.3 miles, and you'll gain about 5,200 feet of elevation. Another continuation along the Mist Trail is Clouds Rest. 
totaling 18.1 miles and gaining 6,200 feet of elevation, this is arguably the best vantage point in all of Yosemite National Park and one that I would highly recommend. If you're looking for something a little easier, Lower Yosemite Falls, a 1.2 mile round trip walk, might be right down your alley. But if you're a little bit of a psycho like me, then Upper Yosemite Falls is the right trail for you. 6.6 miles round trip, 3,200 feet of elevation gain, and you can keep going from there. If you turn left, you'll go to the top of El Cap, which in total from the valley floor is 15.4 miles round trip and 4,800 feet of elevation gain. If you turn right, you'll go to Yosemite Point, which is 8.4 miles round trip and about 3,700 feet of elevation gain. And this is arguably the best view of Half Dome and kind of my little secret because no one likes to go visit here because everyone gets stuck at the top of Upper Yosemite Falls. Trust me, you're going to have the whole place to yourself. Getting to Yosemite National Park. The park is located four hours from San Francisco SFO, five and a half from Los Angeles LAX, and 3.5 from Sacramento SMF, which will be your closest option for a major airport. This park gets extremely crowded. Roughly 3.5 million individuals visit annually, and a vast majority of those visit during the summer months, May to October. As the park is covered in the snow for the entirety of the winter and portions of the fall and spring, that being said, the park is usually open year-round, unless we were talking about 2023, which happens to be an outlier year, where we saw an average snowfall increase of about 250%, and the park briefly closed during the spring. If you are visiting during the peak season, May to October, which is when I would suggest visiting, I would also highly recommend arriving at the main entrance to Yosemite early. Personally, I would get there before the rangers do, just to avoid the lines. I'll often arrive around 6 a.m. just to make sure I get uninterrupted access to the valley. Yosemite Valley is the main attraction for the entire national park. It is basically its own city with hotels, gas stations, restaurants, grocery stores, and numerous other amenities. 90% of all visitors to Yosemite are going to the valley. This is also where you will find the Yosemite Valley Visitor Center and the closest visitor center to the Mist Trailhead. They do have some parking near the trailhead, but you will most likely be parking at one of the many parking lots throughout the valley. You may need to get a little extra walking in before your hike, but I promise it'll be worth it. Just make sure you are paying attention to signage as many parking lots are reserved for specific purposes, camping, hotels, park staff, etc. There's also a free shuttle service running throughout the day from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. during the summer months, with a new bus arriving every 10 minutes. But again, this place is a zoo, and you'll often find that there's no room on any of the buses arriving during the busiest parts of the day. Just try to keep as patient as possible. The transportation experience can definitely test your nerves at times. Vehicle fees for entering Yosemite National Park. A seven-day pass, which is the minimum you can do for a single vehicle, is $35. The annual fee for Yosemite only is $70 per year. The America the Beautiful Pass, which is what I would highly recommend, which gets you access to all national park lands, is only $80 a year. And finally, you have the Senior Citizen Pass, which is for those who are 62+. plus. It's $80 for your lifetime, but just remember, if you lose the card, you got to go buy a new one. They're not replaceable. There is also an access pass for those that are disabled. Uh, you will want to look into criteria online for that. Quick note for my National Park Passport stamp collectors out there. You'll be able to grab one at the Yosemite Visitor Center, open 9 to 5. It's a great spot for gifts and souvenirs as well. I would also highly recommend visiting before you hit the trail, as the hike can take a little longer than you think, and it will most likely be closed when you're finished. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, the Passport Stamp is a program started by the National Park System where whenever you visit a visitor center um, owned by the federal uh, park system, uh, they have a stamp with the park's name and current date on it. Really makes for an awesome keepsake and only costs about 13 bucks for the book. And it's a great way to keep track of all your adventures. Also, if you like to take photos with the National Park signs, uh, the road into Yosemite can be really tight with little warning of when signs are approaching. Uh, grabbing a picture on your way out when there's less traffic would be my recommendation. Next, we're going to go over the camping accommodations. All of this can be found on recreation.gov. Five months in advance, these are the campsites you're going to want to take a look at. Upper Pines, found in the valley. Lower Pines, found in the valley. North Pines, found in the valley. Wawona, on South Highway 41. Hodgins Meadow, on Highway 120, near the valley. This one is also known for being at a slight slant when you put your tent down, so just FYI. Next, we'll have our two month in advance. Crane Flat, on Highway 120 near Yosemite Valley, and also near the gas station previously mentioned, Bridalvale Creek on Glacier Road, which is south of the valley. Two weeks in advance, you'll have Yosemite Creek on Tioga Road, which is north of the valley, Porcupine Flat, also near Tioga Road, Tamarack Flat, also on Tioga Road, White Wolf, also on Tioga Road. One week in advance, you're going to look at Camp 4, which I've actually stayed at multiple times. It's a great campsite, can be a little crowded, but gets you right into the thick of it. Tolu Meadows will be closed until the 2024 or 2025 season. If you're looking to shower, 
They should be available at Curry Village. I would call ahead of time just to confirm. Lodging and hotels that you're going to have available within the valley. Yosemite Valley Lodge, Housekeeping Camp, the Alwani, and Curry Village. Next, we're taking a look at backpacking. All advanced backpacking permits are done on recreation.gov. You can check with the Wilderness Information Center located between the Ansel Adams Gallery and the Post Office in Yosemite Valley for potential next day permits. Wilderness permits open up for application six months in advance and become available on a first-come, first-served basis approximately two weeks after that. Check Yosemite's website for the most up-to-date information. One more side note, the mosquitoes in Yosemite are brutal. Some of the worst I've ever experienced. And if you're going to go in a year with tons of rain like 2023, you're going to have a problem. They are the size of horseflies and aggressive. That being said, let's get into some of the gear you should bring. Let's start off with clothing. Long sleeve shirt, breathable. This will protect your arms from sun and bugs. Boonie hat gives you 360 degrees of coverage. Sunglasses. This trail is extremely exposed, and you will get burned if you are not careful. Running shorts. My legs get pretty hot when I hike, and I cool them off the best way that I can, and that's with a lightweight short. Like I said previously, you will get wet, so a poncho or rain jacket is highly recommended. You should definitely bring a backpack or something to carry all your belongings. I also like to carry a fanny pack so you can have your most useful items readily available. Would also recommend bringing a waterproof cover for your backpack if possible. You may be able to find one that's specifically designed for your pack. Not a necessity, but I would also bring hiking sticks. Can probably get away without them on the way up, but it will really save your knees on the way down. Also not a bad idea to get some knee sleeves. I use them for every hike and I feel like they really help maintain stability. You look a little dorky, but it's better than a torn ACL. Toiletry accessories, uh, sunscreen, bug spray, eye drops, chapstick, mints. Beverages, I always bring three water bottles just so I have plenty. Um, I also recommend keeping a gallon in the car so you don't have to worry about having some when you get back from the trail. I would also consider bringing some Pedialyte. I know they have the packets or the pre-made bottles. It's what professional athletes use. really helps get your electrolytes back up. Something canned with caffeine. I really enjoy the Starbucks double shots. It's what I take with me, and it's how I start my day. If you were over the age of 21, I would also recommend bringing an adult beverage to the top to enjoy. If you're looking for a specific brewery, um, Great Notion is an awesome option. As far as snacks go, you can never beat bringing a sandwich or burrito. As I mentioned previously, Degnan's Deli, really, really awesome. I personally enjoy snacks from Costco. Recommend the Kirkland brand dried mango. Phenomenal, best I've had. The Golden Island Korean pork jerky, also fantastic. And the Blue Diamond Wasabi Almonds. Electronics I like to bring. Probably the most important thing that you can bring in your hike is an external charger for your phone and headphones. Please make sure that it is fully charged and you have the necessary cables for your device. For myself, AirPods are a must. I really enjoy having my Apple Watch on me as well to track my workout. Footwear. For this hike in particular, I wore my Nike to shoot sandals. This is not a normal thing for me. They're similar to Teva's just due to the overwhelming wetness of the trail, but most would be happier in a pair of waterproof shoes or boots. Footwear can be very subjective. Best way to find out is just through trial and error. You'll be able to find links for all these products in the description below. I wanted to share just a brief history of Yosemite with you guys. Again, this is some small parts, but this is surely not everything. Trappers may have entered Yosemite Valley in the 1830s, and a miner named William Penn Abrams reportedly reached Inspiration Point near the valley entrance in 1849. March 27, 1851, Yosemite is discovered by the Mariposa Battalion. Locals called Yosemite Awani, the same name as the lodge, which meant place of gaping mouth. The soldiers named the park Yosemite, thinking it was the name of the tribe, but it was actually local dialect for people to be feared, killers. The federal government authorized the establishment of a state park to protect Yosemite Valley and Mariposa Grove on June 30, 1864, signed into law by the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. In 1890, largely through the efforts of John Muir, Congress set aside land around the state park as Yosemite National Park. Muir continued to urge the federal government to acquire all of the park land and invited President Theodore Roosevelt to visit Yosemite with him in 1903. Finally, in 1906, the state park land was merged into the national park. In 1914, after a lengthy battle with the state of California to protect the Hetch Hetchy Valley, which would be dammed up and used as a water reservoir for the city of San Francisco following the devastating earthquake in 1906, John Muir passed away. As a way to honor his memory, the Sierra Club, John Muir having been the president, named the prestigious trail spanning 220 miles after his name. The starting point for the John Muir Trail is that of the Mist Trail, so remember when you were hiking here, you were truly hiking a piece of history. In 1927, photographer Ansel Adam received critical acclaim for his image of a Yosemite landmark. Shot in his trademark black and white photography, his monolith, The Face of Half Dome, would receive national recognition. 
Adams would go on to continue his nature photography, using his artistic talents to educate others of this beautiful landscape, and leave his mark in the preservation that would follow. His first published book of images along the John Muir Trail would make its way to Franklin D. Roosevelt's desk and would be the deciding factor in the creation of Kings Canyon National Park on March 4, 1940. After his passing in 1984, the Minarets Wilderness south of Yosemite National Park was renamed the Ansel Adams Wilderness to honor his contributions to the natural world. To this day, Yosemite remains the gem of the Sierra Nevadas and an international destination for all of those seeking nature and the therapeutic properties it provides, truly a place that everyone must visit in their lifetime. Thank you for all of those that decided to take a moment of your time and listen to this podcast. On the next episode, I'm going to be taking a look at the Skyline Trail in Mount Rainier National Park. 